Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In general, in book eight of his institutes, John Cassian is going to take what we can call a zero tolerance perspective against anger. We should root it out of our hearts altogether. In fact, towards the end of that chapter, we see him discussing this interesting controversy that came up because there were different uh, versions, slightly different floating around of the Gospel of Matthew, where he asks, and this is the, one of the chapter headings, whether we ought to admit the addition of without a cause in that which is written in the Gospel, whoever is angry with his brother. And he says, uh, you know, get rid of that. There is no good cause for getting angry. And he, what he means is with other people. And so he's going to consider this question then, well, is there any proper or good use or occasion of anger a little bit earlier in the work? And his, his answer is actually, well, yes. You know, we, he says that we have one good use, ministerium, one proper office, you could say, for anger, which happens to be implanted in seratum within our human nature. Now, it's not getting angry with inanimate things. It's not to use anger as a sort of source of energy. It's not to direct anger against our uh, fellow human beings, our brethren, as he would call them. It's to direct that anger against ourselves, or you could say certain features of ourself. So he tells us that this is excellently implanted within us, uh, for which alone it is useful and profitable for us to admit it. So useful, utile there, right? And uh, profitable could also be translated as, to a certain degree, healthy, salubre, right? Uh, something that is good for us. So we can get angry. And what is that going to be? Well, he tells us when we are indignant and rage against the lustful emotions of our heart. So indignant is indignare, right? It's just sort of a transliteration here. And then rage against means to like take the brakes off essentially against the lustful, the lascivious, if we want to be a little bit closer to the Latin, uh, emotions of our heart, the movements of our heart, namely the passions, the vices, the things that are getting in our way. And he says, when we're vexed against the things which we're ashamed to do, or say before other human beings have risen up in the lurking places of our heart as we tremble at the presence of the angels and of God himself who pervades all things everywhere. So when we, and he goes on to talk about how we can't hide from God. When we are looking closely at ourselves and we realize that we're still pretty screwed up as, as human beings, right? then it's okay to get indignant and to take the brakes off, to get angry with those aspects, those lacks, those imperfections, those bad tendencies within ourselves. And so we can turn a part of ourself that normally would be itself vicious against the other parts of ourselves that are vicious in order to try to deal with them, to curb them. And he goes on and he talks about how this specifically works when it comes to anger itself. And it's interesting here because some people would say, well, you can't use a particular 
emotion against that very emotion. Now, can you? And Cassian would say, no, no, you actually can. We experience this and uh, we can you know, conceptualize this as, as well. He says, at any rate, when we are agitated against this very anger, right? Contra hank ipsam iram. So when we are getting upset with the fact that we're losing our temper or we're having responses that feel a little bit scary and out of our control, or we know our, the wrong thing to do, the wrong way to interpret things. And then he talks about three ways in which this works out. So what are we angry with? He talks about when we are moved or when it moves us, uh, com, uh, com, right? So that's the uh, sort of plural. He's talking about we, we're all included in this. When we are moved in our psyche, in our soul, and he uses a word for having stolen or snuck in, right? The anger has snuck in and it is against our brother, our, against our fellow human being. So that is when we ought to be getting angry at it. And we could get angry at it for the very fact that it's like tricked us. It's gotten us to start agitating against uh, another human being. And then he also says in anger, so irati, that's us. And this is the kind of anger that would be good. We force out what he calls its deadly incitements, lethales instigationes. So, an, you know, an instigation, sometimes we call somebody an instigator when they like to stir stuff up. They're like, hey, why don't you go and him fight over there, right? He's saying bad stuff to you. Go, go kick his ass, right? So that's an instigation. And that's what anger does to ourselves, right? And these can be, in fact, deadly, right? Uh, lethales. It can lead us to not just saying bad things, but uh, beating people's skulls in or uh, throwing them off of precipices or buildings or, you know, there are all sorts of other things as well. Ruining people's careers, their reputations, their potential for uh, making money to feed themselves and their families. So we get angry ourselves at those very suggestions, those very instigations that uh, anger is doing. And we try to force those out. Say, I'm not going to go along with you. And then he also talks about not permitting that very anger to have damaging hiding places, noxias latabras. And it's interesting because the language here is talking about sort of like double secrets. We have secrets within our heart or more literally our chest, uh, pectoris, right? And those secret spots can be damaging hiding places, noxias, deadly hiding places, uh, unhealthy hiding places, where that anger can fester, as he talks about in other chapters of this work. So these are ways in which we don't just turn anger against all the vices or bad habits or uh, emotions, but specifically anger against anger itself. And he gives uh, some interesting examples drawn from the life of the, as he calls it, the blessed David, who he also calls uh, the prophet, right? Why? Because uh, David is credited with having written the Psalms and as having, you know, uh, done some other important things. And he says, um, to be angry in this fashion, even that the prophet teaches us who had so completely expelled it from his own feelings, he would not retaliate even on his enemies and those delivered by God into his hands, right? Now he's talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Psalms. And he says, when he had longed for water from the well of Bethlehem and had been given it by his mighty men, brought it through the midst of the hosts of the enemy, at once poured it out on the ground and in his anger extinguished the delicious feeling of his desire and poured it out to the Lord. So this is not anger against anger. This is anger against his desire to have this precious water that required uh, human lives per to be put at risk. He says, shall I drink the blood of the men who went forth on the danger of their souls? Another example, when Shimei threw stones at King David and cursed him in his hearing before everyone and uh, Abishai, 
the captain of the host, wanted to cut off his head and avenge the assault of the king, David moved with pious wrath, it says, against this dreadful suggestion of his and keeping the due measure of humility and a strict patience, said, what do I have to do with you, you sons of Zariah? Let him alone that he may curse. So he's not responding in an angry way to somebody else. He's using his anger against his own potential anger. And then we see him saying, um, uh, here we go. Who is he that, shall, that who shall say to, dare to say, why hast thou done this? Behold, my son who came forth from my loins seeks my life, and how much more this son of Benjamin? Let him alone. It may be the Lord will look on my affection, my affliction. Right. So, David is providing examples of these principles that the monk is supposed to take to heart. And then, interestingly, um, Cassian is going to bring up some. Discussions coming from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which have these two very famous um, precepts, meaning things that you're supposed to do. Be angry, but sin not, right? And let not the sun go down on your anger. What is this supposed to mean? He says, uh, the next verse explains this very clearly. The things you say in your hearts... Be sorry for them on your bed. That is, whatever you think of in your hearts when sudden and nervous excitements rush in on you, correct and amend this with wholesome sorrow, lying as it were on a bed of rest, removing by the moderating influence all noise and disturbance of wrath. And then he says, the blessed apostle, when he made use of the testimony of this verse and said, be angry and sin not, added, let not the sun go down in your wrath, neither give place to the devil. So letting the sun interpreted allegorically, of righteousness go down on your wrath. Uh, if you're angry, he says, we straightway give place to the devil in our hearts, then how is it that above he charges us to be angry, saying, be angry and sin not? So we seem to have a contradiction here. And Cassian's explanation, which reconciles that contradiction, is he's saying, well, what Paul is actually telling you is be angry with your own faults and tempers. And interestingly, faults here is vitis. So it's not just like, eh, you made a mistake. It's a vice, vices, right? So once again, we find the bad things in ourselves, the things that need to be rooted out. We can be angry with those because we're not sinning. We're not doing wrong to be angry with ourselves for giving in to lust or you know, anger or greed or anything like that. At furori vestro, right? So, and your own temper, your own exhibition of anger. Uh, and why? He says, if you acquiesce in them, if you're going to give in to these, then the son of righteousness may, on account of your anger, will go down on your darkened minds. And when Christ departs, you may furnish a place for the devil in your hearts. The Tempter, the one who can't make you do anything wrong, but certainly can, you know, offer you inducements, right? We could go back to anger and its instigationes, right? Its incitements. So, you know, what Cassian is saying here is, yes, there is some limited scope for anger. I mean, ideally, you could get by without it, but if you're going to be angry, be angry at those parts of yourself, those aspects, those dimensions of your soul that is still screwed up and not just screwed up a little bit, but, you know, seriously screwed up. Perhaps even your own tendencies towards getting angry for the wrong reasons, wrong time, all the sort of things that we could list uh, or in general at other people at all. So there is some legitimate scope for anger, but it's pretty narrow. And it's going to be entirely directed back on the person who is feeling that very anger.